and share my screen real quick. Um, I like seeing everyone's comments about weather. I am jealous for all the people who are experiencing somewhat cooler weather. <clears throat> As many of you know, I'm located in the Florida Keys where it is hot, like normal. <laughs> so, but anyway, it's fun to see where everyone's from. Well, again, welcome. Um, and before we really dive into things, I do want to say I would like to acknowledge that this webinar is being moderated on the traditional lands of the Miccosukee and Seminole people and their ancestors. And I pay my respect to elders, both past and present. Um, we're just going to have a couple quick technical notes today, kind of some of the stuff you just heard from Mike, and then we're going to go on to our program for today. My name is Robin Bauer Kilgo. I am the C2C care coordinator, and you just saw Mike Morno. He is our senior producer over at Learning Times. Um, many of you have probably already seen this, but this is our home on the web. This is uh, connecting to collections, connecting to collections.org. On that website, you're going to be able to see where you can sign up for upcoming webinars, upcoming courses. We have a couple planned for the fall that are going to be opening for registration pretty soon. You will also find the full archives of our entire. Um, of our, what we've done. And there's a huge archives there of prior C2C care webinars, C2C care courses, which do become free access a year after they've originally been posted, and our curated resources area, which is also really useful to everyone as well. Um, I'd also point out that we have a link there to our online community. So if you're new to our program and you want to post a question to it, sign up for it. Uh, we have this fabulous group of volunteer folks who will come and help you come up with a really good uh, response when it comes to collections care and collection storage questions. We do have two places on social media where I post information regarding upcoming events. Um, that is our Facebook and our Twitter feed. So I feel, fr feel free to join those or link to them if ever you want to, to get upcoming information. As Mike said, we're using Zoom webinar for this program. Um, there are two boxes which might be accessible for you. One will be the chat box, which is, again, the thing to say hello and what kind of weather you're having. The other one is the Q&A box. Um, the Q&A box is really there for questions and answers. So if you have a question during the presentation today, we encourage you to use that Q&A box. It helps us track the questions. You can even throw one in there as we're doing the program, and we'll jump back to it at the end during the Q&A period. So today we're going to be doing choosing materials for collection storage and I'm going to stop my share real quick if my screen is not being very there we go. Um, we're going to be doing collection choosing collection storage today. Our presenter today is Maggie Hill Kipling, who is an objects conservator in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Maggie spent the bulk of her career in Tucson, Arizona, working on cooperative agreements with the National Park Services Intermountain Museum Services Program, where she conducted collection condition surveys, implemented and advised on storage, rehousing, and move projects, and treated a wide variety of historic, archaeological, and Native American cultural materials. So I'm going to go ahead and hand this off to Maggie, and we will see you back at the end of the Q&A period. See you soon. Hi, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. And there we go. Um, hi, I'm so glad to be here with you all today. And I would also like to start by acknowledging that I'm speaking from the traditional ancestral and contemporary lands of the Dakota people, people Minnesota Makoche. This land has seen a history of violent colonization and suppression of native peoples and non-white people. I wanna celebrate the contemporary Dakota and other indigenous peoples who live here today and honor their ancestors. I also want to acknowledge that this violent oppression of non-white peoples has continued into the present day here. Um, I'm speaking to you a block and a half away from where George Floyd was lynched last summer. And in recent years and months, the Twin Cities has also seen the murders of other black men by police, including Jamar Clark, Philando Castile, Kobe Dimock Heisler, Dolal Eid, Dante Wright, and Winston Smith, along with others whose names we may never know. Um, I think that it's important for those of us in museums to acknowledge that the role of museums and our institutions has often been tied to um, colonization. And while our work is to care for the physical objects of history and culture, uh, while doing so, we can work to amplify the voices of those who have been historically marginalized. And this can really happen in all aspects of museum care, including storage. So with that, we will turn to our discussion of storage. Um, I want to first say that um, there's 
a lot of kind of this idea of the ideal museum storage and you're not doing it right unless you're there. And there's a lot in between um, bad museum storage that's actively damaging your collections and the most beautiful state of the art. And any step forward towards better storage is good. And so any incremental change you can make in your institution, given the limitations that you may have in terms of budget, in terms of facilities, in terms of storage size, any change forward is good. So that's what we're working towards. Don't ever feel bad that your storage is not ideal as long as you are doing the best you can do and making those forward movements, you know, up until and including when you are this beautiful storage. So I just kind of have some some images to show this. This is that kind of um, historic European cabinet of curiosities and you've got a whole host of materials stored together on top of one another. You've got insects and you've got things nailed up to one another, broken glass, the whole, the whole thing. And you can go from that to really crowded storage, but you're using good materials um, to better, but still crowded storage to state of the art, beautiful, amazing, magazine worthy storage. But anytime you're doing those incremental steps forward, that's what we're trying to work with because it, we do live in the real world. So in our discussion today, we are going to discuss a whole host of specific materials, how to choose them, um, ways to use them and why you would choose them for certain applications and not for others. We'll talk about how to kind of assess the stability of these materials, uh, why that's important. And we'll also take some time to troubleshoot um, specific attendee challenges that folks were able to submit ahead of time. Um, and then hopefully during the Q&A, we can maybe address some additional things if, if necessary. Um, we're not gonna go into great detail on museum storage furniture or environmental controls or in-depth design and fabrication of storage maps. There's a lot of resources out there for those things. And um, in the resource list that you can find on, on the page for this webinar, um, there should be some links for some other things, including some past C2C webinars that address some of those things in more depth. And we're also not going to discuss every single product um, or type of material that's out there. Um, there. There are a ton and there are more all the time. And there are a lot that I'm not even familiar with, but hopefully you'll have the tools to start to figure out how to assess those and assess whether they're stable, whether they're things that you can use in your, in your collection storage. And then if you don't know how you can move forward with figuring some of that out. And I just want to kind of go back to the start and good storage is preventive conservation. It is the most basic thing you can do to protect and care for your collections. Um, if you haven't heard of all the agents of deterioration before, here they are. Um, we have physical forces, thieves, vandals, displacers, fire, water, pests, pollutants, light, incorrect temperature, incorrect relative humidity and custodial neglect and dissociation. And good storage can really address all of these. Um, and here's kind of a, a diagram of all the different kinds of parts of storage. You've got your building, um, which does a lot to give that ground of your environmental um, an envelope. You've got the rooms that things are in and you can have um, environmental controls happening at the room level as well as at the building level. And then you have your cabinets and shelving um, that can be another additional layer of protection. And then you have your box or container, any additional enclosure that there might be, and of course your object that's in there. And we're gonna mainly be talking about that box container enclosure object area. And these two colors, the green and the blue for the box container and enclosure are intentionally very close because sometimes those things overlap. Sometimes you don't have both of them. Sometimes you only have one or the other. And we'll kind of talk about why, why you may have enclosures within boxes or you may not have a box or a container and things may be, may be straight on the shelf. We'll talk a little bit about how your shelving interacts with your box and, and enclosure today as well. So back to these agents of deterioration. When we're looking at your facilities and furniture, they really focus on all of these, these big things. Little less with the physical forces, um, except where you're talking about 
earthquakes. Um, you can incorporate some of that into your furniture in terms of earthquake strapping and other, other ways to help to protect your materials. But otherwise, um, those facilities and furniture are dealing with, with most of these ones. In terms of your individual storage choices, they will affect everything to some degree. Really, those physical forces, that's going to be your primary place that your storage is, is really holding up your protection of your material. But also that custodial neglect and dissociation, making sure that your, your piece all stays together, that your catalog numbers are, are kept with your object, your um, any pieces don't get detached um, and dissociated and lost from your from your other object. Um, and then also you can do microclimates to um, deal with things like incorrect relative humidity. Um, and your containers can help to deal with light damage. And again, microclimates to help deal with pollutants. I kind of have started to think about designing storage and breaking it down into these like seven S's, uh, which I hope will, will be useful for you. Um, there is looking at your size and shape of your object and how that interacts with the um, area that you have to store things with. So what, um, what are your limitations in space? Are you working with shelves? Um, are you working with hanging racks? Do you have cabinets with drawers? Um, do you just have large open areas and huge giant objects? Um, and ideally what orientation and shape should your object be in? Um, is it something that is best stored flat? Is it something that can be upright? Um, how, how is something gonna be safest? You may not be able to do that in your existing storage. So you're gonna then be thinking about what kind of compromises you might, you might make and how to do those most safely. And then support, that's really looking at how, well, actually I'm gonna go a little more in depth with these as we go through the slides. So I'll go through it a little more quickly. There's your support, your surface of your material, looking at the fragility of your surface or other surface characteristics. Um, sensitivity, meaning cultural sensitivity. How are you storing your object so that it is most respectful to the culture that is associated with that object? Do Are you giving say to the peoples who are culturally associated with that object and making sure that it is cared for in a way that is respectful to those traditions? And then access, making sure that your objects are able to be accessed by researchers or by cultural groups for cultural use and how best you can give access safely for your object. And then looking at special environments like microclimates, like increased air circulation, there's a variety of things that we'll talk about there. And then the st stability of your storage materials. So I always like to kind of start thinking about the, what I would like the storage to look like and then choosing materials, making sure I have stable materials that fulfill those goals. So again, looking at size and shape, um, what are your limitations of that storage? The orientation, I kind of covered some of this already. Um, do you have really big objects? How are you gonna store these really big objects safely and protect them from the environment? Do you have little tiny objects? How are you gonna store them and keep them organized and safe and protected? And there's a variety of different ways that you can accomplish those goals. And here are some, some other things. You have um, a couple of um, items of clothing, either hanging storage or flat storage and how these things can be padded out and protected. Um, large textiles potentially being rolled if you have access to rolled storage. There are also ways to store large textiles safely in boxes and kind of thinking through those things and what your limitations are is, is what's going to be helpful. And support. This is where we're looking at your individual materials and what they need to be safe in terms of those physical forces. Um, there's a piece of uh, a taxidermied uh, great horned owl here. Um, and this 
was made to be hanging on a wall and not given no storage space to store it hanging on a wall um, safely so that it's protected. How can you store that? Um, this is a, an upright that was made um, so it could be hip, hooked on using its existing hook, but also supported down at the bottom. So not all of the weight is, is going on that hook and it's not relying on that only that one hook to protect the object. Um, or a piece of ceramic that's round bottomed. How do you support it so that it's not rolling? Um, this solution um, is using a piece of um, polyethylene backer rod to create a pot ring or nesting fragile material inside nice little padded containers. There's a lot of different ways that you can approach that support. And surface, are your surfaces extremely friable? Um, there's some uh, fragile organic archeological materials on the left that are, um, there's a burned piece of wood that's um, got a lot of friable carbon on the surface. Um, other plant material that just by its nature um, does a lot of shedding. So how can you reduce the shedding? You want both padding to um, protect it in terms of any vibration, um, removing any of that, but you also want a very smooth surface so that just being on a surface isn't abrading that surface and causing more damage. On the right, you see a pot that was inside a cardboard box. Uh, for transit. And you don't think that a cardboard box is abrasive particularly, um, but you can see where the paint actually transferred and there was some damage that, that took place because it was in contact to with this box moving. So what very, um, uh, very smooth surfaces can be used or how can you protect the surfaces better in storage? And then um, this concept of choosing culturally appropriate storage. Um, in, in the work that I've done in the Southwest, um, there's been a lot of interact interaction with tribes that have, that have told us that their preference has been for natural materials, not using synthetic plastics. These are um, some pots at the Arizona State Museum that were stored in um, uh, padded uh, stockinette, cotton stockinette, pot rings because these were um, felt to be a little more culturally sensitive, culturally appropriate materials to be in contact with the pots than like ethophone pot rings. And there's a variety of ways that you can come to these decisions, but the best, the best things that you can do is consultation. Um, uh, one of my colleagues, Audrey Harrison, who's Navajo in, in Arizona had a really great um, example of this work when she was working with um, some plains dresses um, from Grand Teton National Park. Um, there was a mother's dress and a child's dress, and the child's dress had actually been um, identified as a NAGPRA material. Um, if you're not familiar, that's the Native American Graves, uh, Graves Protection and Repatriation Act of 1990, I believe. And that governs how um, a variety of Native American cultural materials can be treated by museums. Um, and because this was an agri piece, um, the Park Service and, um, and the parks don't seek to display it at all and give it special consideration during storage in the ultimate hope that it will be repatriated. Um, and during consultation, it was actually determined that this child's dress that was um, a NAGPRA material was actually associated with uh, another adult woman's dress. And the tribe expressed a desire for them to be stored together um, and for them to be stored with sage. Um, it was determined in discussion that there couldn't be active smudging taking place, but to, to store them together. And so Audrey was able to work with the curator at the park and the curator at the um, storage, the NPS storage facility to make sure that that could happen and that these dresses could be together. They could be protected um, and stored together and stored with um, 
with appropriate materials to honor their traditions. And that I thought was a really great example of making sure that these culturally appropriate storage solutions could be made to happen. And then we have access. These are some boxes in Guatemala. Um, these are from the site of Ahuateca in, in the Paten region of Guatemala. Um, and it was excavated by um, archaeologists largely based in the US. And at the end of field seasons, um, all of the excavated materials are handed over to a government storage facility, as I recall. And these were particularly items that were, um, were seen to be potential uh, exhibit objects. So they were probably gonna be accessed more than other materials. And so storage was designed, these are all going into, um, into several trays you see there's actually three different trays here. Um, there's one photo that has um, the top on and that's it with the top off showing all of these different objects. So you can lift out the trays, you can kind of see everything easily. Um, and it's also, this was it before, um, before the rehousing into, into these and they all fit into a file, file style box um, for, to go into the government storage facility and to be best protected there but also um, easy to access. Um, also you can have tiny materials. Um, here's a little bone awl um, and it's stored in a bag. It's on a card and with Velara padding and it slides into this bag. It can be stored upright with a number of other objects so you can kind of go through them really easily and quickly and see everything without taking them in and out but it is also really easy to take in and out. Or there's this archaeological textile um, from Tonto uh, National Historic Site, and they this is stored in a mat so that you can see the object. And it's actually not stitched down in any way to this backing, so that researchers who are wanting to really closely examine um, the weave structure can do that and do it from both sides. You're actually seeing both sides here um, in this picture. So you can see how, um, how accessible it is to researchers. And yet it's got a um, thin layer of, this is stable text um, over the top so that it's actually held in place when the, when the mat is closed. But that mat just easily opens and you can see it. You can actually flip over the textile and access both sides if necessary. And there's a muslin backing on the on the backing board that through a nap bond can help to keep that textile in place um, without having to stitch it down. And then we have these special environments. Um, there are a lot of different reasons to create special environments. And I, I say special environment and not uh, a micro environment um, just because there are other things besides that, and we'll get into that a little bit. You may want to control humidity um, or control oxygen. You may want to protect the object from outside pollutants or to contain hazardous materials or to absorb materials that are actually being generated by the collection object that could be harmful to either itself or other nearby materials, or you, which all of those things are these are microenvironments that you would create. But you also may want to increase air circulation for certain materials um, that are off-gassing where actually using an absorbent might not be the ideal solution. And we'll talk about that a little bit. So plastics in particular are a really big challenge. And there are a few um, at the Park Service that we had um, identified as being particular storage problems um, that we wanted to address. Um, PVC is one, uh, polyvinyl chloride plastics. Um, so you're thinking those kind of, um, some of them are made to look like leather, a little bit rubbery surfaces, um, like this little pouch on the left. And one of the problems with PVC um, is that it, it um, seeps some of the plasticizers that are in, in the flexible PVC. Um, PVC pipes don't have the same, same kind of issue, that hard PVC, but um, the flexible PVC has plasticizers inside of it, which tend to seep out over time. And 
your normal plastics that you might be more familiar with using in storage, like polyethylene, um, actually can absorb those plasticizers and, and drive that, that, um, that reaction forward where the plasticizers are leaching out, they're being basically sucked up by the polyethylene. And so we need to use very specific materials for storage of PVC to make sure that that doesn't continue. And so this is stored in mylar. The other um, suggested material that doesn't um, absorb PVC or react, or doesn't absorb the plasticizers in PVC or react negatively is glass, which is not always the most ideal storage material given that it is breakable, it is heavier. So mylar, polyester, is a really nice storage material for PVC. And it's also clear, so you can still see the objects. So this is stored in a little PVC pouch and then put into an archival storage mount. On the right is um, a small little toy soldier from Manzanar. And that is a really interesting object. It was identified as potentially being Wayule, which is a natural rubber that was actually produced at Manzanar um, for during um, Japanese internment. And it was um, only produced for a short period of time there. So it's a really unique and interesting object. Um, and we don't have a positive identify identification on it, but it, it appeared to be possibly a regulate object. So um, particularly important to preserve. And this was actually stored in an anoxic environment. So this is a laminated plastic um, sheet known as escal that's been heat sealed closed with an oxygen absorber enclosed in the bag. Um, and that little pink dot you see there is um, an indicator and it stays pink as long as there's low oxygen. Um, when the oxygen gets higher, which it eventually will. Uh, mescal is a really good vapor barrier, but it's not perfect. And so eventually that will um, that will turn kind of a purple or blue, and then we'll know that the environment needs to be changed out. But then there are other plastics like cellulose nitrate or cellulose acetate, which generate acidic vapors when they're in storage and when they begin to deteriorate. And those acidic vapors can be damaging particularly to metals around them and to other materials and they will continue to to generate um, a cyclic um, degradation process if they're enclosed with acidic vapors so one of the best ways to deal with that um, is to actually increase air circulation so this was a solution um, at at the NPS storage facility WAC in Tucson, um, developed by Dana Sengi there, who, um, where all of these materials are stored. And you'll notice that many of they're stored in a way so that as much of the surface area is exposed to air as possible, which is a little unlike other storage mounts we might use. But this is to make sure that as much air is getting by and dissipating those acidic vapors as possible. And these are stored high up in storage and in an area where, where there is a little more air exchange than other areas. Um, you are less likely to want to use absorbents with these kind of things because the absorbents can become quickly depleted and potentially um, even dangerous. Um, you may be aware that cellulose nitrate, um, particularly when in films um, like negatives, um, can actually become somewhat combustible. Doesn't tend to be as much of a problem with um, plastic materials that have that have been made. We haven't really seen much in the way of combustion of those, spontaneous combustion, as with negatives and historic films. Um, so these aren't generally stored in cold storage like negatives are, but this is um, this has been a really interesting and um, cool storage way. And I'm I'm really I'm really interested to hear in the future how this how this goes and if it has really successfully slowed down degradation of these objects. Um, another place where you want to create microenvironments is often low humidity storage for metals. Um, 
some metals are extremely sensitive to humidity, um, particularly um, iron when there have been chlorides present and they can drive their degradation anywhere over 15% um, humidity. So getting really low humidity in storage, much lower than, than you would want in the rest of your storage can be really important. These are um, storage containers that have been made using um, plastic um, gasketed boxes like you would use for food storage. These are polyethylene boxes. Um, they're much thicker um, than other polyethylenes. So even though polyethylene isn't always a very good um, vapor barrier, the increased thickness in testing um, showed that it was able to um, slow that um, buildup of humidity within the boxes. And um, then you've got silica gel placed in here as well. In the back on this drawer, you can also see another object that is using that escal. Um, and these actually even tend to hold up better over time. Um, we did notice that in certain, in certain situations, the silica gel was getting exhausted rather quickly in these boxes. Um, whereas these Escal packages were holding their humidity low for a really long time. So anytime you're doing any of these microenvironments, it's important to um, really go back and look and um, see what you're, what you're actually maintaining and making sure all of these have humidity indicator cards that you can view from the outside so that you know when you, your humidity has gone up so that you um, can address it without having to open boxes and introduce humidity um, or whatever it is that you're trying to control, um, like with the other with the oxygen. And then here's kind of the meat of, of what we're going for, which is the stability of our storage materials. Um, anytime you're buying commercial materials, it can be a risk. It's always preferable to buy from an established archival museum or conservation supply company. Um, they tend to have, have testing that they can produce um, results for. Oftentimes they've actually done audit testing. Sometimes that's not possible. And um, whether it's because you're in a in a part of the world where you don't have um, archival storage companies that, that specifically supply those materials um, or for cost or for availability of various types. So when you are buying commercially, you do wanna look for acid-free materials. Um, acids are damaging to most materials um, that we wanna protect in our museum storage. And so that's kind of one of the first things you'll look for. Um, you, there are um, permalife paper, um, which we'll get to in a little bit, is kind of the standard for archival storage. But photocopying and printing paper is generally fairly stable. There's a lot of calcium carbonate fillers that have been added, mostly because they're cheap and they're, they make the paper nice and bright white. Um, and they actually tend to be such a large alkaline reserve in the paper that it it keeps them stable for a long period of time. So um, when you're printing records um, or need paper for other things, you are generally okay using your standard photocopy paper, but there is no guarantee if it's not classed as acid free. So that is something you should try to look for. Um, plastics, the plastics you wanna try to look for for museum storage, um, here in the US, we have numbers for recycling on a lot of plastic materials. So you want to look for numbers one, two, four, and five. Um, number one is polyethylene terephthalate. Um, and then you've got high density and low density polyethylene. Um, got, uh, oh, I've got polypropylene on my slides twice, sorry, <laughs> and polypropylene. Um, Again, when they are commercially available products, you are likely to have additional plasticizers that have been added. And while the plasticizers in polyethylene might not be as obvious a problem as plasticizers leaching out of historic PVC, um, they can cause problems. So when you're using plastic bags, things like Ziploc bags that you buy off the, off the shelf of the store may be less ideal than 
little baggies that you can buy from um, your archival suppliers. Um, it's also with, with baggies in particular, um, often as, as we saw in that slide earlier, um, if, you're, if you've got bags that are sized really well for your objects, that can help make your storage safer for your materials. You can store things stacked together, um, almost like index cards, and they can stay safe and stable. You can, you can build housing for them that is smaller and uses less materials. So there are a lot of reasons to um, use various sizes of bags that may be more appropriate sizes for your materials than like one large sa sandwich bag. Um, and then textiles. This is probably a place where you can do pretty well commercially. Um, in conservation and museums, we tend to use a lot of cotton muslin, unbleached cotton muslin, and that you can get commercially really easily. And I would just say to make sure that you wash it before using. There's almost always sizing and starches that have been applied and those we want to get rid of um, and that you can just wash and dry in your normal washer dryer situation and and that will be helpful. Um, starting off with paper products um, and now we're getting into those um, archival materials that were that you can get from your archival suppliers. Um, you can use everything and there are applications for everything from tissues through normal like bond weight paper to folder stock or thicker card stock um, boards and then corrugated boards. Um, if you have to use materials that are not necessarily acid free or you don't know, you have old reused materials that you're using, you can use papers that you know are good to line the interiors and to line any places where you may have contact between your objects and your storage material. So using an acid-free material um, can be really useful um, just to line a material. If you have to use regular corrugated board, um, lining the inside is a good first step to, to protecting your objects. And I just want to quickly talk about buffered versus unbuffered paper and why you would use them. Buffered papers um, or boards use, um, or tissue, uses an alkaline reserve that's been added. Um, this can help to do a few things. It can help to um, absorb acids that are generated by materials that they're in contact with. Um, and it can, they can help to maintain their own stability over time, um, both in terms of those, those acids coming from other materials and any acids generated from wood paper pulp that was used to make them. Uh, buffered materials are great to use with most paper artifacts, with cotton and other plant-based um, textile materials and fibers. Um, but you don't want to use them for most photographs, particularly color photographs, um, or with protonaceous textile materials like silk or wool. Um, that's where you would want to use unbuffered materials. Um, whenever in doubt, go with unbuffered. Um, unbuffered, uh, even if you're using them with acidic materials, they aren't going to actively damage your object. Um, whereas using buffered inappropriately can actually cause damage to um, some materials. And then there's also materials that have microchamber um, technology. Um, some of them are called microchamber, some of them are called art care. It's a product um, manufactured by Nielsen Framebridge. Um, and those actually um, have zeolites built into, um, into the paper products. And zeolites um, are aluminum silicate um, structures that can trap um, other materials inside of them, be they pollutants, acids, other things like that. So they can very actively help to preserve your materials in a way that even buffered materials cannot. Um, buffered materials will do some um, neutralizing of excess acids, but the zeolites in the art care products actually can, can more actively pull out and trap acids and other materials that are in your objects. So they can be really cool when used appropriately, but they are also very pricey. So just some, some photos of different materials. Again, there's, there's tissues. You can use them for 
wrapping materials for interleaving. You can use them for bunching up and, and adding padding to, to textiles. Um, there's your permalife paper. Um, and you've got cardstock and folder stock. You can use them to make boxes and trays, the, the heavier weight ones, or even the lightweight ones can be used for small uh, trays and boxes for little lightweight objects. Um, you can use them to make support boards to go into bags. Um, there's really, you can use them for interleaving in between things. Um, or heavier boards for making boxes, um, mat board for making mats um, that can be used really as a good, good storage material for flat objects. Um, and then there's um, uh, boards used for cardboard tubes that can be used to store textiles or large, flat, flexible objects. Um, and you can see a bunch of those tubes on the right. Um, and then corrugated board. Um, and I'll just point out that um, there are different types of fluting on boards. Um, and I believe it's that the, um, the E flute is actually like thinner and stronger. And the B flute is a little bigger and, and bulkier. Um, and you can get those double corrugated. Um, I haven't seen cross corrugated board in a while, which is when you have the corrugation going one way in one board and the other way in another, and that makes for a much stronger board support. So if you have a really large object that you're needing to create a handling tray or a support board for, um, that cross board is really good. But you can also make that yourself by taking two pieces of uh, regular board and, and gluing them together. Um, great for making, making boxes. Um, there is also bigger, um, thicker, heavier weight materials. Um, this is called a uh, hex amount, I think. Um, and it's kind of a hexagonal structure in between two boards. And that is a lightweight material that can be used for, for even bigger things. And then moving on to plastics. We've kind of discussed some of those different types of plastics. Um, some of the guesswork is taken out when you're buying them from archival suppliers. Um, but the kinds of materials that you're looking at are going to be boards, foam, blocks and planks, foam sheets, um, thinner plastic sheets um, like the mylar that we talked about. Tyvek is a polyethylene um, that can be used and comes in different textures and weights. Um, Teflon. Um, just like the Teflon that is inside your nonstick pans and that we are hearing more about why that isn't a good idea to cook with, but it can be a great material for collection storage. Um, in those earlier slides I showed of the, um, the organic archeological materials, um, those cavities were all lined with Teflon because it's very smooth, nonstick, <laughs> and it, it is really nice for those very soft, friable surfaces. You can also use it to wrap things that are very sensitive um, without it then pulling off some of that surface. So there's a lot of ways it can be used. It's not always the um, easiest material to work with, um, but it's, it's a really useful material when you have really fragile things. Um, just polyethylene sheets. That can be used for dust covers um, or for wrapping certain things or for making your own bags. You can heat seal poly polyethylene sheets into custom bags. Um, and of course, those plastic bags that you can buy to, to size all the different sizes that you can get. So here's kind of a look at the different plastic boards and, and foams that you can use. Um, at the, on the bottom, there's coroplast. You can use it in much the same way that you can use all of the paper boards, but sometimes plastic board is preferable. Um, you can carve um, this ethafoam, polyethylene foam into shapes and cavities and cutouts. Um, you can use it for um, posts in between different layers of boards when you're storing multiple things together in a box. Um, there's a couple of different kinds of baccarat that are available. Um, this is round, the round baccarat, that's kind of the most common. There's also this um, uh, the, the trapezoidal um, baccarat that's now available. Um, sometimes you can get um, tri-rod. I don't think it's 
so readily available anymore. It was originally uh, manufactured for use in building log cabins. So it's this triangular, um, much um, finer celled um, foam, uh, polyethylene foam in triangles. Um, that was really great because you could cut it and it was very smooth on all surfaces, even the cut surfaces. You can see on this um, trapezoidal uh, polyethylene, these angled surfaces are the cut surfaces and they're a lot rougher. So you have to be careful of how you're using it or covering that with another smoother material if it's in contact with objects. But both this and this can be used in a variety of ways to make bumpers for trays, to keep objects in place, um, to make rings. You can see a ring here, you can see a ring here. So there are a variety of ways that you can use those, those types of baccarat. And then there's your various sheets and, um, and other products. Um, there's the thin F foam sheeting. You can get it in a variety of thicknesses. It can be great for lining things. Um, this is Volara. Um, it's a really beautiful closed cell foam, very soft, um, really nice for, for cutting small things, um, cutting little cavities. Um, I really like it for those card mounts that go into bags to cut out a little, a little space for them. Um, you've got your Tyvek that comes in this soft, much more flexible surface, or the very smooth, um, little more rid, little more rigid, little more foldable. Um, and this is what that um, Teflon sheet looks like over on the right um, that you can use to kind of conform and lie into um, into cavities that you're lining. I like to kind of cut around, use it with ethafoam. And I'll cut around the edge of the cavity um, part way in and tuck it in with a spatula or bone folder to hold it in place. And then there's clear plastics. Um, in the middle, there's mylar. Uh, it can be used um, not just for storing PVC, but it makes great uh, enclosures for paper materials. Um, there is tube, um, tube polyethylene sheeting that you can get. And we found that really interesting for storing um, uh, potentially pesticide treated um, animal skins um, and bird skins. Um, so not, the not necessarily the taxidermied materials that are big and like formed into poses, but the um, natural history co collections that are just a, a little bird skin. I think I've got some, some images of that in here as well. Uh, and then there's textiles and non-woven sheets. Um, uh, you'll see the cotton tool tape on the left. That's actually so useful for so many things. <laughs> tying things together, tying things on. You can make little tags and labels with it that can be stitched to, to things. Um, you can use it for non-adhesive joins. Um, so if you want to tie a box together and not be using any adhesives um, for the box, it can be really useful for that. Um, creating handles for trays. There are so many things that you can do with um, cotton tapes. Um, we use a lot of polyester batting um, with, with um, either Tyvek over top or um, of course the cotton, unbleached cotton muslin. Um, I mentioned stable tax earlier, which was a really nice polyester fabric um, that could actually be like melted along edges to create really fine um, seams um, and like even heat cut into shape. And that unfortunately is not available anymore. The closest thing available now is a polyester organza, which can be used kind of similarly and silk crepe clean can be used similarly, but because it is silk, it also can, can degrade over time a little more easily. Um, Reme and Holotex are both spun bonded um, materials that, that can be used for a variety of things, including interleaving, including support fabrics, including covering things. And then uh, materials used in specialized environments. Um, there's oxygen scavengers. Um, there's RP systems, which is revolutionary preservation systems, which um, is a 
material developed by Mitsubishi and ageless are kind of the two most commonly used ones in conservation. And with those oxygen scavengers, you need to use a vapor barrier. Um, Marvel seal, which is an aluminized um, laminate material um, or SCAL, which I showed before. Um, Marvel seal, I think is a little easier to get, but because it's aluminized, it's opaque in color. So you can't see through it. Um, whereas the SCAL is nice because you can actually see through it. So that means that in terms of access, you can get visual access for an object much more easily. So the bag doesn't need to be opened as much to see objects, to do inventory, to do whatever else that you might need to do with, with an object that um, with the SCAL you don't need to open. And then desiccants, um, which also um, are good to use with vapor barriers. Um, that's like your silica gel, and that helps to reduce relative humidity inside um, an environment. Uh, and then there's those polyethylene gasketed boxes, those food storage boxes that we talked about. Um, those are really nice in terms of access because you can just pop them open to get access. But again, we do see some leakage of those a little more, more um, a little quicker leakage um, in terms of the humidity um, getting in. And those aren't as good for using with the oxygen scavengers um, because uh, when, when the oxygen scavengers work, they reduce the volume significantly in a container. And so that would suck in and then it ends up in those, those gasketed boxes, it ends up breaking that seal um, when it starts to suck in and then you just get get everything coming in, which may be part of the problem that we've observed with the gasketed boxes and the desiccants as well. And then there's um, those art care boards that I discussed before in the zeolites. Um, those are really great for enclosing things, whether it's um, framed prints or um, other materials. You may have materials that have a lot of um, smell to them. Um, even if they've, they've been in a fire, um, zeolites are really good at absorbing that odor. And then there's silver cloth, or um, there's also corrosion intercept, uh, both used um, to help to preserve metals, um, particularly like uh, for the corrosion intercept, you might use it for um, copper alloys and the silver cloth used for silver. Those both have sacrificial metals embedded in the material that corrode before the pollutants will reach the object that you're protecting. And these are some examples of all of those. On the top is the marble seal. So you can see how that is not, uh, you can't see through it, but it is a really excellent vapor barrier. Um, the silver cloth um, below there. And on the right, those are those um, bird skins I was talking about using that polyethylene tubing to heat seal. And then adhesives. Um, we, these are again, just for mounts. These are not uh, materials that you would use on your objects, <laughs> but hot melt adhesive. Um, there are a couple of different ones av available. There's a lower melt that's available for foam and a higher melt that's available for board, um, double stick tape. Um, and then we found again um, in some tribal consultations where we're wanting to use more natural materials um, wheat starch paste or fish glue. Um, fish glue is nice. You can buy um, high tack fish glue already made. And so it can, that can be really convenient to use and it dries a little more quickly than wheat starch paste. And then those non-adhesive methods, like I talked about with using the cotton tapes. And tools that you wanna use, you need boards to cut on, different kinds of knives for cutting your foams and carving your foams. Uh, tools to uh, fold. Um, there's a bone folder there to cut metal rulers. Um, so a whole variety of different types of tools available. We really found, I really found that using ceramic knives is really nice with foam. Um, they, of course, if you drop them, they will break. They can get chipped really easily, but they do cut through ethafoam really nicely. And now we're to the point that we have some specific challenges that were submitted by a couple of webinar attendees who are hopefully here with us today. Um, and I'm not 
I, I'm not sure whether they wanted their institutions named, so feel free to pipe up if you want to um, to say that it's you. So I didn't I didn't associate your names or institutions, um, but if you if you want to take credit, go for it. This one was um, submitted um, from an institution that um, annually has an event where they have to remove all of their um, art from the walls in in several galleries. And currently their method for storing these is using these pool noodles, which are ethafoam, which are actually a pretty great material because these are probably commercially available ones. They may have some other materials in them that might not be ideal, but it's actually a really cool idea. Um, the concern that the person who submitted it had was that the pool noodles um, might not be a fit, as effective for that separation as possible, but also that they had some frames that were really ornate and that might be being damaged by them. And that concern is is really quite accurate. Um, putting on and taking off these pool noodles in this way really could be damaging to the frames. So um, what I would recommend is just this. This is from um, in the resources I sent. I, I um, linked um, CCI notes. And this is from a couple of different CCI notes, 10.2 uh, 10 and 10.3. This is using padded blocks. So using um, a big foam block that's that's wrapped in, in stable materials to keep the painting up off the floor. You wanna keep, um, keep objects whenever they're stored on or near the floor, you wanna keep them raised up and that's, both to keep them clean, keep them a little safer from, from a whole variety of things, from pests to being kicked, um, and also for water, any sort of water emergencies, giving them a, a couple inches off the floors is, is gonna be very helpful. And um, the recommended way of temporary storage of paintings is just using these padded, padded blocks to keep things off the floor, separating paintings with boards, with rigid boards, corrug corrugated board generally, um, and you want those boards just to be bigger than each painting. And it's generally best to face um, that you're painting on the back, you probably don't want facing the wall, but then the others you want facing the wall. And you don't want more than like four to five paintings together. And it may actually prove to be a lot easier to do this, a lot quicker than the pool noodle solution. So I hope that this is useful. And then um, the other submission I got was for a museum that is a collection of large industrial machinery. Um, ooh, let me just fix the slide for a second. I don't know what happened. A couple of um, couple of shots of their storage, um, where it's a lot of uh, large uh, industrial machinery. Um, they're in the early stages of doing a complete overhaul of their storage. Um, right now they have large objects mixed with smaller objects that know that they're going to be adding shelving and rehousing small objects onto the shelving. Um, and I, I think that the largest question was kind of how to address all of these large objects. And right now you can see a lot of the large objects are stored on pallets on the floor and pallets are a great way to keep things up off the floor as I, as I mentioned before. Um, but you can see here, there's Harley Davidson's stored on here. You can get really large shelving and I know I wasn't gonna really get into shelving, but getting really large purpose-built shelving that can support um, some of those large heavy objects putting those large heavy objects onto shelves means that you're gonna also have to have appropriate machinery to use them, and such as pallet jacks and forklifts and securing the things to the pallets that are being put up higher. Um, large objects also might need custom, very strong cradles to kind of keep them in place and strapping to hold them onto, um, the, onto the pallets. And then things that are staying on the floor, which is acceptable, um, as long as they're raised up on those pallets, keeping them protected from dust and light um, with dust covers. And this one is a dust cover made with Tyvek. You can use polyethylene sheeting. Um, you can even use uh, muslin depending on your, um, your needs. Plastic sheeting will be more likely to protect from water if, if that's a, a big concern. 
um, and Tyvek will allow a little bit more air exchange um, as well the textiles. Um, Tyvek is kind of that middle ground. It'll give a little bit of, of protection from water, but not total uh, protection from water. But the polyethylene sheeting will also allow you to see what's there without having to, to lift it up and look. So there's just some, some suggestions and I hope that's useful. And I think that we're about there for questions and answers now. So I will uh, peek at the questions and answers that we have. <laughs> that was great, thank you. I was just sitting here thinking, but like I've been in this field for gosh, it's 15 years now. And even like being a registrar and it's so good to just have these sometimes it's almost like refreshers of being yeah. like, oh yeah. <laughs> like it's just like little things that you just kind of remind yourself of yeah. if, you, if you don't deal with a particular type of collection mm -hmm. or I don't know, it's just something you haven't thought about in a long time. It's yeah. just nice to kind of hear the information. Yeah, this isn't, um, you know, the most, probably the most complex or technical of the topics covered by, <laughs> by CTC, but it is a good, really basic um, overview. And so that's what I was trying to, to accomplish for folks. And that's what you need sometimes is just an overview. Cause I mean, there's so many people out there with diverse collections that you just never know what you yeah. come across. So I'm going to add real quick before we get in the Q and A, I just put a link in the chat for our resource page. So Maggie put together fabulous resources for this webinar. They're all linked on that page. And then eventually there'll be um, the recording for this webinar on there as well. And there's also the survey link, but do that at the end of the presentation. So just so you guys know. Um, all right, so let's start looking at the question. And a lot of the questions are people asking for recommendations on materials. So where to get them, where to buy them. I know you had built something like that in your resource sheets as well. So let's start looking at some of those. Maybe we can kind of get those out of the way first. Um, someone says, what adhesive do you recommend to join corrugated paper board to form cross corrugated board? Um, usually we've used um, just hot melt glue. Um, when you're doing really big sheets, you have the problem of making sure that as you're putting it on, it doesn't, it doesn't cool so much that it's not sticking. So that can be a little bit of a challenge. Um, you may want to, in that case, go to one of the other materials. Um, like wheat starch paste, it's going to be a longer process. It's going to take a lot longer to to dry, but you you have a little more working time. So you you have choices. You can you can use any of those materials that that I talked about. Really, perfect. Um, the gasketed polyethylene boxes I've been able to find are fairly small. Are larger ones available anywhere? There know. have been. I know we um, at at WAC where we were doing this project, there was um, a lot of inconsistency of the supply um, of what we could get and where, but there were some bigger containers available, not giant. Um, they weren't they weren't big enough to, you know, store huge objects, but we could get we could get some fairly large ones. And then if you can't switching to the Escal um, or Marvel Seal material can be really useful. And again, those are gonna be better vapor barriers. Um, the Escal, I was just looking the other day and the supplier we used to get it from didn't, didn't look like they had it as readily available. So I am concerned that it might not be um, as readily available. I don't know if it's a pandemic <laughs> thing or uh, and it's temporary or what, but Marvel Seal, I think, still is widely available. You just have that issue where you can't, you can't see through it, um, which is problematic. Um, we did do some testing um, with um, like bag seals. And I know that our, the Mitsubishi product, the RP, they, they sell the Escal. Um, but there, we didn't buy Escal from them. And I don't know if that's because they had stopped supplying it in the US or if it, we were just able to get it cheaper. Mm -hmm. But um, they actually sell that ba uh, bag seals specifically for Escal packages. So, but I think we were buying just commercially available kind of the really nice chip bag seal things so that we did have some that were sealed. Uh, I think that as long as it's a pretty flat seal, it works really well. If you have like folds going into there um, or like rolling the sides and if it's a more dimensional package, 
it doesn't seal as well. But again, just keeping those humidity indicator cards in there and keeping track of them, getting some kind of schedule to check can be really useful. Yeah, someone actually did say, can you please spell or explain a scale absorb? absorb it is on the glossary sheet. So if you look at the glossary sheet, I did try to put um, a lot of these more unusual materials on there, but escal is E-S-C-A-L. Um, there's a couple questions talking about hot melts and different type of adhesive you recommend, both low temp and high temp. Do you have any? Yeah, there, oh, um, I think that's on the glossary sheet as well um, that has the types there. Um, I am blanking just a tiny bit on the, the material off the top of my head. Let me, let me see if I can get there really quickly. I'm sorry. That's um, fine. And I put the link again for the resource page on there. Okay. If you guys scroll down to the end, you should be able to pull PDFs and the presentation. Got too many windows now. You can stop sharing your screen too, if you want to, just so oh. it looks like a little easier. <laughs> Thank you. No, no worries. <laughs> ah. Here, let me help you. Stop here. Thank you. There you go. Um, Close that out. Here's the chat. Sorry. Um, um I, yeah. I'm sorry, I'm, I don't wanna like waste time trying to look for this right now. But yeah, the, I'm pretty sure I do have that in the glossary, the materials of the of the high melt and low melt. Um, they are also, at the very least, I think university products carries them. Um, and so you can look at them, them on there. Um, this is, I think, probably a question that a lot of us are in. It says, I am with a very small museum with a small budget. So I find the archival company solutions are just beyond our resources. Mm -hmm. Is making one's own boxes a more affordable solution that, than buying ready-made boxes? And would a cost-effective measure be to buy more commercially available storage containers and use the unbuffered, unbuffered board and tissue to line them? So if you can get stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And that's exactly the thing is just figuring out what's, what is most realistic for you in your budget. And yes, lining, um, lining poorer materials with good materials is probably going to be your cheapest way to go. Um, and then in terms of making your own boxes, you really have to factor in the time, <laughs> the staff time it takes, because that's a real cost too. Yeah. And um, so yes, you can save money by building your own boxes. And you can also have really great effects by being able to having have really custom boxes that really fit within your spaces that can be really useful but the staff time that it takes to make them can be really a challenge if you get volunteers in and have them doing it that could be a really great way to go <laughs> as well. yeah well i know and like i know the people who i know who are good at box making like i am a novice like i can do basic ones but like I, I knew some people who were very good at it, you know what I mean? So the yeah. fact that they knew how to and knew how to measure and all that kind of stuff, it's, again, that was always the skill set, but I'm like, man, I wish I had a better skill set <laughs> doing that because I would watch them do it and I was like, this is magic. <laughs> I was like, and yeah. some people love box making and some people don't. And I am not one who loves box making. Um, I can make a decent box, I guess, but um, it's, it's not my favorite thing to do. Yeah. Um, but I know people who love boxes and make beautiful, beautiful boxes and can do it so much more quickly than me too. Oh yeah, totally. And I like what you said too, is like you, I always think about this, that, you know, you walk around places and you, you sit there and you try to do the best you can, what you, mm -hmm. right. You try to be pragmatic about your approach. And sometimes you can have all acid free, everything looks great, all chloroplasts, and sometimes you can't. So you just yeah. do your best and you kind of work within your budget and you, you know what you want, but you have to be practical. Yeah. About what you're about. Yeah, so. never, I, I don't want anyone to take away from this that they're never gonna do well enough. They are never gonna be able to afford all the best materials. And so therefore, you know, throw up your hands, it's gonna, there's always something little that you can do to make your storage better. 
and just kind of understanding how to make those best decisions that you can make given your very real circumstances is what I want people to take away from this. And I, I hope that that's useful. <laughs> yeah, no, it is. And I will also add that when you said about the cotton tool tape, I literally wrote down, I heart cotton tool tape. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like literally the first thing if ever I walk into places and they don't have any I'm like what's my a huge full of cotton tool tape because you can <laughs> use it for so many things so I completely agree. Yep. Um, are there any precautions that need to be taken when storing paper in plastic bags? That you well I, I would say the the biggest issues to worry about with paper in plastic is um is worrying about humidity um and creating a mold situation um because trapping humidity in with your paper is going to be dangerous um so i yeah i think that that's probably the the biggest issue also if you have old um old acidic papers you're kind of trapping them in there with that um, so having some sort of other material in there to both buffer the acids and buffer the humidity could be useful, um, but also just not fully sealing the plastic. If you have a, an enclosure and it's, it's only sealed on, you know, two or three sides or even just as a folder is, is a nice way to go too. That's good. Uh, someone mentioned in the chat that Mountain Plains Museum Association has a great purchasing discount for its members to buy archival supplies from the big suppliers. Nice. And that other associations often have similar discount programs. Oh, so it's great. always good to check in and just yeah. see there. So, so thank you for sharing that. With yeah. Um, someone says, how are zeolite materials for natural history specimens? We have marine collections that tend to smell in exhibit cases. I, I live in the Keys, so I get that smell. <laughs> like yeah, I, it, I don't, I don't know of any real downsides of zeolites, so I would say go for it <laughs> if you can store a small amount of zeolites in with a cabinet. And you can you can buy zeolites commercially. Um, there's a product that we've gotten recently at. Um, at like Home Depot and Ace and things. It's like Gonzo, I think. It comes in a plastic bag and it looks like just a bunch of rocks in a bag. Mm -hmm. And um, that can be hung in an area. Um, there's there's actually a ton of commercially available ones. And I, I, I think as long as they're not giving off an odor, like that there haven't been perfumes added to it, you're probably gonna be pretty safe because they're not, they're sucking stuff in, they're not putting it out, so. Um, so this is, I work in a hospital archives with a large collection of approximately 2000 19th to 20th century surgical instruments, some metal, most in original cases. I'm not sure gasketed boxes are in our budget, but would silica gel or escal be helpful to use in regular archival boxes to lower the humidity? Unfortunately, no, unless you're creating that um, enclosed environment where you're not getting a vapor exchange, you're just gonna be throwing that silica gel away, basically. It's just gonna get exhausted and you're gonna start over. Um, sometimes your cabinets are well enough gasketed that um, if, you have, if you have good metal cabinets with gaskets, sometimes those are enough to to hold a little bit of an environment and keep that a little lower. Um, but um, yeah, unfortunately, um, it's kind of either getting a, um, a good environment in your whole building or in your whole storage area or dealing with those microenvironments. Now, I would say not, not every metal needs a microenvironment. Not every metal needs that. You, you want those environments for things that are actively corroding. Um, metals that are showing very active, um, active corrosion, like powdery flaking metals are, are what you need to worry about. And a lot of the time those um, are gonna be like archeological metals, um, things that have been in an environment where they've been subjected to like chlorides and other things that have gotten in there and are, are making that driving that corrosion reaction. Um, so I would say don't don't try to do everything, but if you do have some specific materials that you're concerned about, trying to get all those 
stored together in a limited number of containers is where you want to probably focus whatever money that you, you do have that you can put towards that. Yeah. When I'll say, they went on to say that they're using ecofoam and foam sheeting to create enclosures within the archival boxes to reduce movement and objects touching each other, which I think is super smart, right? Mm -hmm. That to me is more, I can understand the corrosion being hurt, but just them banging into each other, I think mm -hmm. it caused more immediate damage. So that was a good yes. effort to stop on prioritizing. That, that, those physical forces, mm -hmm. right? And that's like, that's where your individual storage is most is like the biggest powerhouse <laughs> is dealing with those physical forces. So yes, stabilizing them in a container so that they're not bumping into each other is where you want to focus your, your energy. Yep, exactly. Um, in order to create a non-oxygen bag plastic, could you recommend some extra information or a bibliography? And they would also like to know more about the pink and blue oxygen indicators. Um, yeah, those are usually, those, those oxygen indicators are usually sold where you can buy the oxygen scavengers. They usually sell, it's, um, I think it's usually called an, either an oxygen indicator or I've seen it called an ageless eye when it's sold with, with ageless. Um, and usually, I know with ageless, when you buy it, there's, there's one that comes with the container of ageless, so you can reuse that too. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then you can buy additional ones to, to put in with things. And yes, there, there is a lot of material out there on creating anoxic environments. Um, I think that there is some in the resources list that I gave you. Um, and there, um, on the resource list, it has where you can get some of those materials as well. So hopefully you'll find all that in there. Perfect. Um, someone says an art handler we work with recently recommended Dartek film for wrapping a ceramic vessel for packing. It is a cast nylon film that is clear and, and this is in quotation marks, softer and more comforting, conforming, comforting would be funny, conforming than mylar. The description on Talus says it can absorb 10% of its weight in moisture. Would something that absorbs water be bad to use for long-term wrapping slash dust cover? Well, if you're thinking about, um, like wrapping in DARTEG versus wrapping in tissue, your, your tissue absorbs, I, I don't know the percentage, but any sort of cellulosic material is gonna absorb some water as well. So I would say as long as you're not using it in contact with, with metal, and now I've lost, I lost the question, but um, for, I think, was Lauren asking about using it for ceramics? Um, I think, let me check. Well, I lost two. Um, ceramic vessel for packing. Yeah. Um, I don't. I don't know that there's a reason not to use it um, for packing for like moves and things. I really like for ceramics um, wrapping in a layer of tissue and then in a bag. Um, I think that Dartek would be a more expensive thing to use than than that that particular way. I don't know if it's for a longer term situation, if you'd be gaining much. Um, I'm not as familiar with Dartek. Um, I haven't used it in years. And when I used it, it was in, um, in the context of painting treatment <laughs> a million years ago. So um, uh, I can't speak to that one so clearly, but somebody was just talking about it yesterday. So I wish I had um, gotten more information then. <laughs> Sure, we can follow up later, but thank you for that. Um, someone asked, will hot melt glue work for adhering chloroplast boards as well? Yes. Yes. And you can get away with the higher temp one for chloroplast. It's not gonna melt with the high temp um, in the same way that foam foam will. Excellent. This one I think is super interesting because I I think one of the biggest challenges we're gonna see over the next probably 25 years is all this weird plastic stuff that emerged, right? So someone has, we have an inflatable pool toy slash mattress, PVC. What would be the best way to store that object? They say inflated, question mark? Oh yeah, what a good question. I know. Um, and I, I don't know. <laughs> I, I guess I would be tempted to say yes. And I think I've seen some, some conservators working with flexible plastics like that and actually filling them with inert materials. 
Um, unfortunately, what I think I've seen before maybe hasn't been with PVC, but um, they, I think they were using like um, polyethylene beads. Mm -hmm. I wonder if there's a different kind of small bead or something like that that could be used for the inside. I wouldn't want to use the polyethylene because of the issue I discussed earlier where you're um, potentially drawing out some of those plasticizers in the PVC. Um, but definitely I would consider inflated because it will embrittle over time and you'll get hard creases. Mm -hmm. um, but thinking that it would be nice to fill it with something other than air so it won't deflate. Um, yeah. So I'd have to think on that. I would be happy to follow up with you. Um, I, I'm pretty sure I've seen some references to that, to, to something very similar in the, in the conservation literature. So I can maybe find that, track that down and figure out what was used and if it was PVC. That just seems like such a challenge. So I mean, I'm thinking like, how would you get it in there? Like if yeah. it's like a true, you know, blow up mat, like things I've always dealt with, it's like, it's gonna have like a little, you know, the valve, you know what yeah. I mean with the thing. Yeah. So I'm just sitting there like. Usually those valves, if it's the kind that you like blow up, yeah. um, there is a space so you can get stuff in there, but it would have to be a small enough bead to get through there. And you right. have to like, I mean, that, that does seem to fall within the realm of conservation treatment, <laughs> almost more than, more than just storage. Mm -hmm. So you might want to get a local conservator um, on board to, to kind of help out with that. Yeah. Even if it's just to figure out the solution and kind of help with, with implementing it. Um, but yeah, so then once, once you decide how the shape that it's going to be in, I think definitely enclosing it in, in mylar would be a good way to go. Yeah. And then the issue too is just once you blow it up, like let's say you find figure out a way to safely do that, then you're gonna have this giant thing. Yes. Like a yeah. your, and like then your you storage. Have the challenge of taking up space and making sure that you you have it in a safe space. Yeah. So that's something I'm gonna be thinking about. Like in the middle yeah. of the night, I'm gonna wake up at 2 a.m. and be like, I don't know how you would do that. Um what someone did say in the chat too, you might ask the folks the Boston Children's Museum, they might have something similar, which that's a good idea. Just to reach out hmm. to the children's museums and see how they deal with that if they have a collection you know what i mean which some might um you might have to reach out to them. yeah the um the bird skins poly tubing sealed on all sides um yes here's a little example <laughs> um there it's just tubing and sealed on one end and then for those um we actually had a label that was then sealed on the other side um so that would have all of the the materials. I did a bunch of uh, rehousing at Zion uh, National Park with their bird skin collection and they sent me a little gift after. <laughs> nice. <laughs> and I love it and it's a great little example to show, but yeah. Um, someone's asking about humidity problems on a budget. So they're a small hundred plus year old building, store a number of objects from swords and surgical tools to old books. How can we improve the current humidity problems on a budget? Is 90, I feel your pain. They're saying it's 90 degrees outside and 61 in here, and I'm at 55%. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it is, the struggle is real. Um, yeah. Uh, coming from the desert Southwest, where I worked before, where our, we were always um, dealing with having usually lower than museum ideal. Um, humidity to kind of being in other parts of the, the country in the world where the humidity is way higher a lot of the time is, is a real challenge. And I would say that just really triaging your collection, because um, what you can't do with, with your overall environment um, uh, through the mechanical side, you can look at your most vulnerable materials, the things that you're most worried about, starting with the, anything that you're seeing actively deteriorate in ways that are, are linked to problems of high humidity or fluctuations in humidity, taking those things and addressing them first. And if that is a microenvironment, um, I should also say that one thing that, that is a really um, good thing to do for some things, this doesn't I wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend this for metals so much, but other things that are sensitive to environmental fluctuations, having them stored in, in like layers of a cellulosic material. So wrapped in tissue, enclosed in a cardboard box, in a cabinet, those things are all gonna kind 
kind of slow those changes. So at least you're not going to be seeing problems of rapidly changing sh shape due to humidif humidifying and dehumidifying, um, kind of getting that that curve of that up and down humidity to kind of like slow down a little bit, the more um, hygroscopic materials, so um, paper-based materials largely that are around your object, the more that's going to slow down. Yeah. Um, that's, with, that's with right. Metals that you're not just trying to slow the change, you want to get it down. So that's where you really want to go to the uh, microenvironment. Um, but for other materials that are sensitive to those changes, but um, aren't damaged by the higher humidity in the same way as metals, having more cellulose materials around um, might be one way to address it. That helps. Yeah, I was going to say that fluctuation question is always the thing that I struggle with. Because oftentimes I feel like, especially with some objects, if all of a sudden you took them, if you're in a situation like they're in, and you all of a sudden put them in the perfect temperature and humidity, the, the object can almost get damaged because of that mm -hmm. sudden change, right? Yes. So yep. I'm always more thinking of, okay, how do we just make it steady so we don't yep. deal with fluctuation for yep. that particular object? That'll probably help the mm -hmm. people overall more than anything else. yeah and and in the desert southwest where we had the consistent lower humidity um we were dealing with a lot of archaeological materials um organic archaeological materials that were used to very low humidity right they'd been in a cave for hundreds of years and that's why they survived this low humidity now it may not be um the perfect environment for you know paper or other cellulosic materials because a lot of that tends to lose that bound water when you're in the low humidity so it's not flexible anymore but it's stable and you're never going to get that humidity back in there right and so because we were dealing largely with materials that had been in that low humidity environment for most of their existence that was acceptable um, now, our other storage space that had archives, that was a little higher um, priority to keep that humidity a little bit higher. Mm -hmm. um, but the most of the objects were pretty happy being a little lower than the, you know, ideal music museum environment. And so that may be the same for you, especially um, in other parts of the country and other parts of the world. If you're dealing with collections that are from your area, that may be the case. Exactly. A whole other discussion. <laughs> yeah, no, well, exactly. And just to, you know, just we'll leave this topic alone. I always thought about that because again, I work in the southeast, right? So if I would all of a sudden take my stuff out to the desert, I'd be like, whole oh. <laughs> like just watching it like dry and become husk like in like five seconds. So yeah. it's yeah, it's the same as the flip side. Yeah. Um, so we'll do a couple more because it is 2 30. So 2 30 Eastern, excuse me. Um, we are planning on building our own storage boxes with corrugated polypropylene. Will hot melt glue work or should we buy the metal buttons to join the sides of the boxes? Hot melt will work. Yep. Hot melt will work. You can, if they're really big, um, so that you're having a lot of force pulling those corners apart, then the metal might be good or the twill tape. <laughs> yeah, I love the twill tape. Um, <laughs> but yes, for the most part, hot glue will work. Make sure you're going to clamp those corners when the when it's cooling just so that you're not having it already trying to pull apart while it's cooling um and so for our last one and i'm going to pull all these questions and send them to maggie and we'll figure out a way of following up with people because there's still some good questions floating around in here um if you do not know the types of plastics your objects are made of how would you recommend storing them taking into oh. consideration they could be plastic. yeah <laughs> um it, it is a challenge and um, we at the the at WAC, the Park Service facility I was at for so long, we did big plastic surveys and there were still a lot that we didn't know. We had specific tests that we could do for PVC and for cellulose nitrate. Um, and then we looked at certain characteristics. If they're smelling if they smell like vinegar, you, you pretty much know you've got cellulose acetate. Um, if they smell really bad and kind of look like the cellulose acetate but don't smell like vinegar, that's probably cellulose nitrate. <laughs> um, but you can also have newer 
or, or less degraded versions of those that aren't necessarily off-gassing yet. And so it can be really challenging and it's challenging for conservators to identify all of those different plastics. Um, so I don't have really good overall um, storage recommendations for you, except that in general, I would say having increased air circulation is better, um, but it's not true across the board because um, with with rubber, that's not going to be the case. And rubber is not a synthetic plastic, but it, um, it sometimes it can be really hard to tell all of the things that you may have. Um, but but rubber is going to do better with low oxygen, so that's the opposite. Um, but I don't think if you have um, a lot of those other plastics, increased air circulation is still going to be okay. I would just be careful about light exposure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. Well, it is two after, so it's 2.32. So I'm going to have to wrap it up for today. Um, thank you, Maggie. That was great. And someone actually said in the chat, this is one of the best C2C care webinars they've been in recently. Yeah. Good job. <laughs> I really appreciate it. I'm going to remind everyone that there is the link to the resource page, which is where you guys registered for this uh, webinar. And there's the survey link for this uh, webinar as well, both in the chat. So please take those if you have a few minutes. I want to say a huge thank you to uh, Maggie again. A huge thank you to Learning Times, to our technical producers, IMLS, FAIC, all those fabulous people. Um, we are skipping August for our free webinar series just because there's a lot, a lot of other stuff happening right now. We'll be back in September um, and for the rest of the fall. And we have a course hopefully launching at the end of September on Native American collaboration. So we're looking forward to that one as well. So keep an eye on our website. And thank you all for joining us. Hope you have a safe August and we'll see you here back in September. Thanks. And thanks again, Maggie. Thank you.